at AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ray Dramas of XY Advisor here. As always, very excited for this week's XY Live podcast. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, my fellow panelist, Peter Diamantidis, co-founder, self-confessed geek hybrid of uh, <laughs> Caboodle <laughs> Financial Services. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for sharing the time. And Adrian Paddy, I'm sure many of you know Adrian uh, very well of AP Financial Solutions, uh, Spark Professional, Spark Training, and of course, XY Advisor. How are you, mate? Pretty good. Pumped to have Peter on. <laughs> yeah, most certainly. Let me get the keywords done first. So disruption, buzz, fintech, buzz, apps, buzz. So we've hit all the, all the keywords, so at least we should go a bit higher in the, the Google search. But I think you know, a big part of today is actually, you know, recognizing that, you know, there's, there's a lot of excitement in this space and, you know, lots of shiny toys, but uh, realistically, when we go to work on Monday morning, how does it change what we're actually doing at work? Uh, and, and to that end, I think that's, that's the, the, the groundwork which led us to put together the event for next Thursday, the 23rd of November down at Stone and Chalk. We're doing a Silicon Valley on Bridge Street one of the reasons why Peter is so appropriate to, to join us today and also um, uh, also be the, the host of the evening on Thursdays, uh, literally spending time in uh, Silicon Valley and, uh, and FinCon last month. Uh, so to that, Peter, I might ask if you could share a little bit about uh, how you all found it. Yeah, look, it's... Um I love traveling overseas just to any conference, um, even if it's well outside our industry, just because you get such a different take on the world and this trip was no different. Uh, so FinCon, for those that don't know, is a personal finance bloggers conference. Um, it's grown up from a little 50 person one only about six years ago, I think, six or seven years ago, to this year was 1700 attendees. Um, and what's interesting about that is there's only a handful of advisors in those 1700. So most of them are just people in their offices or garages blogging about paying off their student loans or, or getting rid of their credit cards or frugal living, things like that. And they have built a huge traction and a huge following. So FinCon to me is, is a journey to understand how to build a tribe um, and a following. And it's something that I just don't think in Australia, we really, well, particularly in advice, we just don't get. I think we get how to get the next client. I don't think we can understand how to get the next 10,000 followers, you know, so... So that's what FinCon's about to me. And they were going hard with that this year. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. Lots of talking about things like conversing with your audience before you create content. So don't just build something. And it's relevant to what we're talking about with FinTech. Don't just build something and then push it to market. Go out and talk to your audience, engage with them and let them define the product you build. So, or even rap about it, hey, Pep? Exactly. There was this awesome rapper. So um, look, it's one of those moments when you're, when you're almost out of your own body, right? So you're in the main hall, there's 700, 1700 people in this, in this hall, we're watching the keynotes. And then the next keynote is D1, D double E1, who is a rapper who raps about financial literacy, would you believe? <laughs> and this guy, like he's a full on rapper. If you saw him or heard him, I mean, he's just one of those guys, right? But he, instead of talking about bling and women and his next big car, he's talking about how his car's got a hundred miles on it and how hundred thousand miles on it and how, you know, he's, he's got no credit card, that sort of stuff. And it was awesome. But what was, <laughs> The coolest thing is he actually did the rap on stage and then crowd surfed through the crowd. And the whole time as I'm jumping up and down and yelling and, and singing along with everybody else, I was thinking if this was a financial advice audience, we probably would have dropped him. Like, <laughs> we're just so disengaged with that stuff, so scared. Is that because of the average age or? No, <laughs> we've got, we've got, <laughs> maybe, but we've also got this scepticism in our industry. You know, we're mm. so quick to judge people who are different. And so we would have gone, what's that dude jumping up? At, why is he so excited? You know, like it, it just, whereas this buzz in this crowd is we're all just, you know, I mean, it was like a huge concert, you know, we're all there with him celebrating his reach. I mean, he's been on Oprah. He's been on all these shows because his message resonates and it feels accessible. And so it really, for me, stood out about how maybe we're just not quite getting it right here in that maybe we take ourselves a bit too seriously. 
with financial Yeah, you, you do have to uh, credit our colonial cousins for really, you know, being able, being able to be really good at talking about what they're good at, but also, you know, understanding their, their identity and just embracing it. You know, I think yeah. sometimes in Australia we're like, oh. <laughs> Absolutely. And they share their mistakes, you know, yeah. really willingly. And that's what um, FinCon does really well too in the concurrent sessions. Um, the sessions are people just like us presenting on what they've done, but literally telling everything. So this was great. And then I screwed up here. Don't do that. You know, so they were really willing to completely open themselves up, which is so valuable because learning what not to do can be as important as learning what to do. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, look, I, I always get a lot of, this is my third year and I always get a lot out of it, but um, I think it was really great to see a whole lot of other advisors coming with me, you know, and, and joining us all um, and some people sort of out of advice um, like Naomi and, you know, Jenny Pierce. So that was really great. But I think it just highlighted for me how I, I haven't gone far enough on that sort of one to many engaging with the public model, you know, and, and is it your sense that these guys, are, it's, it doesn't sound like they're worried about, uh, you know, the robo taking over their jobs and that sort of stuff. It sounds like they've well and truly understood that there's a place for them in the world. Yeah, look, I think particularly for them, because most of them aren't advisors. So mm. um, because they've, they're telling stories, then a robo can't take that over, right? I mean, storytelling is such a person to person thing. Um, and in fact, they've had uh, the number of advisors going from locally from over there drop because the financial advisors don't get it, right? So, so I do think um, there is a lesson there in terms of where maybe our energy should be focused on. Uh, yeah. For me, I think robo-advice is awesome. I want to be a bionic advisor. That's my aim, right? Powered by robo-advice, but adding the human element. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the being afraid of that stuff is silly, particularly as you know, it's here. <laughs> Well, Adrian, maybe maybe one for you because I know you like to to look at all the the different apps and and those and and you know automate as much of the process as possible. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a big statement, but you do hear the view of things like uh, financial advice isn't regulated. It's actually the products that is that is regulated. So if you remove the AFSL from from engaging with a client, like it sounds like these bloggers are, and they're just providing helpful general information, mm. it's kind of what people want. Um, I don't know, mate. Do you kind of have a view back back home on that? Yeah. Oh, well, um, I guess we've never really beat around the bush that the reason why SOAs are like they are is to enable a product um, recommendation that's palatable and um, can sort of st stand up in terms of um, uh, there's been a due diligence that's gone into it. But um, if you look at where what clients get value out of, it's got nothing to do with um, the product a lot of the time. And, uh, yeah, it's all the all the communication piece and the behavior and um, I guess the interaction. Um, and a lot of the time it's a relationship piece. Like it's, uh, and that's what I think, I think when you start to look at, that'll be interesting next week with the FinTech piece is what are the, what are the, the new services or apps? What are they doing to, to engage better and just improve that communication? So like a lot of ones are coming through and they're sort of, the playing on the functional space, which is there's lots of pain points there for sure, as everyone knows in the industry. But I guess the frontier is how do you engage with clients better, and what how you how you pulling people out of their lack of inactivity, and what do you what's prodding people to take action and get a better outcome for themselves? So yeah, where are the more Fitbit sort of style prompting behavior change versus just analytical replacing a formula? So the nudges, yeah. the nudges as uh, yeah. Richard Thaler, who actually just won the Nobel Peace Prize in economics. Uh, he's, he's the behavioral, the behavioral guy. And uh, yeah, he, he talks a lot about uh, nudging people to do the healthier or the better, the better alternative. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Most, you, most... We're getting that all the time. I mean, the way we shop it involves, as he says in, in his book, you know, it involves a whole lot of those little small things that cause you to behave a certain way. It's why all the chocolate bars are on the exit of the, um, when you go to Coles, you know, that sort of stuff, the, the little nudges that get you to do things. It's just that in our industry, we've just ignored that completely. Totally. <laughs> So, nah, yeah. they've never been any good at that. Surely it won't work. We'll do it the way we've worked on it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still guilty of building Rome and they'll come, right? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Um, what, look, what, one, of the, one of the things I think, you know, I, I, I often look at the, um, you know, the, the index in the US and, and the, the, the list of businesses over there. And it really gives you a sense of what's happening overseas 
in terms of uh, the the, um, the different sectors. So, you know, uh, re resources obviously there, but uh, one of the major ones is technology and information and, and sciences. I think there was an article recently in uh, the Fin Review that talks about STEM, the science, tech, engineering, mathematics. Now, if you cross over to the ASX 50, <laughs> we're not really doing anything other than digging holes and, uh, and, counting, money. and, and counting money for the guys that are digging holes. And that's yeah. kind of it. Um, and it, it kind of, of strikes me as, as sorry, mate. There's a lot of threatened sectors um, in that grouping. <laughs> but but that for me suggests that the the there's there's nothing but real opportunity for guys that are playing in this space. And that you know part of the reason why Peter's again really qualified here is you know having that experience doing the the funding and understanding uh, what what makes a good idea an actual viable business. Um, you know, actually come to fruition. And, and I think, uh, Peter, perhaps some questions to, to rely on H2 Ventures, Ben, Ben Heap, mm. um, you know, keen, keen on what your, your sort of approach will be with him because, you know, he's, he's obviously qualified there to, to say, well, you know, we see guys that have all these wonderful ideas all the time, but actually it's three or four key things that we look at that actually makes it a, a business. Yeah. And look, it's, um, it's so true. And, and like we were saying before we went live, then, you know, I've been through the first tech bubble and, and the mistake then, and the words used were different, but the reality was the same that something viral isn't necessarily something profitable. And so I see that a lot in a whole lot of the apps coming out where it's groovy and funky and isn't that awesome and the marketing's great. And I'm like, yeah, but are they making any money yet? You know, like, mm. And if they don't in a long-term sense, then their service isn't going to be any good and it'll all disappear. How can that be great for the client? So the way in which they can monetize their idea to me is so important um, because it's great if, I mean, if, if we're all in an environment where it was philanthropic and they could just, you know, provide this stuff for free, that's fantastic, but it's not the real world. And so I'm really interested in what and how they assess a fintech in that respect, because I see a lot of things that are viewed as a quotas as successes in our industry here that I'm still waiting to see, well, based on what I'm seeing, the number of people they've got on that, on that platform they can't be making money, you know? So, mm -hmm. so where's the tipping point? How do they assess that? I think it's really important. Totally. And it's, it's their cash, right? So, you know, they, they, they're going to be pretty ruthless about that stuff. Well, and you'd be surprised though. And I think that's the issue when you've got um, a popularity, popularity funding game, which is what's happening at the moment, right? The volume of money going to fintech is unprecedented. Um, and it's what happened before. So I was an analyst when the, the, the tech bubble happened all those years ago. Let's not talk about how many. In Australia? <laughs> Yeah, in Australia. Yep. And so I was in investment banking and so, but I worked actually in the infrastructure area. So that's all about mining, trains, railway, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so there's a lot of he capital heavy, but cash flow flows really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, as an analyst, really what you end up analyzing is the cash, right? It's net present value, it's discounted cash flow, it's that sort of stuff. And they seconded me into the tech space and they wanted me to do some analysis and there was nothing for me to analyze because not a single one of the businesses they were looking at for their clients had any cash flow. Wow. And so I was, I was saying, well, I don't know how to do my job guys. Cause I've been taught that really the value of something now is a discount of the future cash flow generated by that business. And there ain't none ever. <laughs> so, and I can see that issue now where we get caught up in the enthusiasm and the genius. And there is a lot of genius but we've forgotten some of the fundamentals in terms of what makes a great long-term sustainable business. Mm. And that's why, and the only shame to me, I mean, it, I mean, that's the VC's problem, right? They're the ones throwing money at it. But the shame to me about that is throwing good money after bad when it could be applied elsewhere. Mm. I, I wonder, I wonder if also there's the risk that our industry, we're obviously, you know, we're, we're starting not from behind the eight ball, but there's certainly a bit of, bit of legacy stuff there. And, you know, my concern is if we as an industry run to the next shiny toy and we change our minds every five minutes because the change is happening so quickly, whether or not people are actually going to start saying, we're not interested anymore. Like, I don't care. Like, you've told me this five times and you change your mind every 10 minutes. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think there's a huge danger of that, particularly when... I mean, some of the best ideas um, are the ones that can get embedded into an industry and just become part of the fabric, you know, and so every, so so something that was thought to be small becomes part of the everyday, you know, becomes the hoover. You know, when we all use the word hoover to describe vacuuming, that was actually a brand, you know, so they made them part of the fabric. And so that's what you're looking for as an idea like that. And so you don't want these VCs or the money to start going, well, hold on, we're not just getting, we're just not getting that sort of traction. We might have some shining lights, some fireworks, 
once in a while, but we're not seeing that thing that changes the face of the way people engage with money, as an example. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I'm not seeing that yet either. I haven't seen something where a single idea, I'm like, oh, wow, hold on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this is almost like a new world. I'm seeing fringes of ideas, but I'm not seeing that thing that sort of cuts through um, the reality of what we do. That's what I'm excited to see. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of um, when we did that uh, innovation day, Peter, with uh, Zuri and um, a couple of the ideas. Sorry, I remember I came up with the idea that Facebook would just analyze your life because they know so much about you and give you a financial plan and you just approve them to um, tap into all your finances and right. they do it. They actually do it for you and it's right. all algorithm. They, they map, map it to your activity. Yeah. Um, would that be sufficient for you to go? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I might be convinced. I think um, I think a lot of for advisors, particularly though, you know, we're not just looking for widgets. Um, we're looking. So for me, I'm not interested in innovation. I'm interested in applied innovation. So something that's that's great and it's been worked on well. It's look, it's efficient, and then I can inject it into the process in my business, and it can enhance what we either do for clients or the way my team work. And so, um, interestingly, a few of the ideas, and I get as you can imagine, I get a whole lot of people coming and running things past me, which is great. Um, but a lot of them don't have the ability to engage advisors in the process, right? So like, this is a great idea, but how can I use it? Cause it almost excludes the advisor. So yeah, to me, yeah. that's one of the biggest issues with all of them. They, they're not allowing for that, you know? In, in our space where we're currently working with a, a doctor of psychology at Sydney University, and we're developing this, this uh, well, what we think is an enlightened way of doing things. It's a values based process, but what well, you're right. One of, one of the, one of the challenges is, creating a scalable process so that it's commercial, but in a way that you're still maintaining a relationship and the engagement's thick because they kind of, they don't, they're not necessarily correlated. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you kind of, you know, what, what I'm seeing at the moment, it echoes your sentiment, Peter, that, you know, the, the guys who are doing really interesting things aren't really making money because it's, it's you know, they're, they're doing really wonderful things for their clients, but it's just not commercial. Um, which yeah. is wonderful if you're in a position where you can do that, you know, but I, I unfortunately, I'm, I'm, you know, I still need to, you know, get a deposit for a home, let alone pay off a mortgage. <laughs> well, the thing is, I mean, the, the reality of, of business is that you can do more great things by, by productizing and monetizing the offer, you know, so that means if you get mm -hmm. that one right, well, we can then apply that to this sector of the market and then we can, and that gets to more people, it gets to more clients, you know, I mean, the, the whole we're only getting to one in five Australians, part of the issue is because um, we haven't managed to get those ideas that can then be built on you know, and, and yeah. be made bigger and get more traction. Um, and it's why your comment about, you know, our stock exchange and the, I mean, the banks, I think make up 25% of the, of, you know, <laughs> the index then, I mean, while institutions that are that big, no matter what type of institution they are, while institutions that are that big are such, such a huge part of our economy, I think we've sort of got to wait around our necks. So unfortunately we've just got to sort of sort of fight against that to get this innovation happening without the cash as much we've got to find ways to really bootstrap this stuff yeah yeah and i wonder also one of the things i would learned uh, a couple of years ago i was fortunate enough to go to a u.s study tour in, in new york and boston so i was more the the funds management side of things and spent some time at state street and they've got a center of applied research with ha which have no commercial outcomes that are related to state street it's actually a really wonderful thing and one of the things that they were talking about is really interesting for in services at the moment is there's there's something there's a staggering amount of wealth being transferred to younger gener the Gen X and Gen Ys over the next 15 to 20 years, uh, and the idea is that the people that inherit the money are going to want a totally different service to what the mum and dad do, you know the guys we're we're dealing with now, so you know to that end we've basically got that that's our timeline to get this stuff right <laughs> and build something that that you know the you know we would we would deal with if, if uh you know we were we were our clients so to speak yeah exactly and i think um you know that's part of that i mean we all talk about diversity in the industry that part of the issue we've probably got with the industry is we're probably weighted both by age and gender and even um background you know and so so yep. uh, different demographics and i think that's probably holding back some of that development you know because it's very hard to get out of your own experience it's human nature isn't it you know you come from it from your perspective and so if if the perspective of financial services here is 
is one picture that I think we can all imagine what that looks like, then yeah. it's going to be difficult for them to start developing things that break out of that. You know, I mean, it's, it's um, quite an unusual person that can think that way. So nice. unfortunately, I actually think diversity is playing or the lack of it is playing a bit of a part in this innovation. Mm. You know? I think we're getting the same thing over and over again. Well, I guess, the, I guess one of the things that challenges around the fintech space is, or in just technology development in general, is that it, it actually, um, they, they work off what's the demand right in front of them. And that, that way of thinking means that if that bulk demand is still where the wealth is now, you're not getting the investment in things where they're going to be. And it's, that's where you've got a bit of a, like, the, the true winners are going to be the ones that are, have enough guts to actually, like the ones with the resources and have enough guts to really have a stab at sort of moving things along out of their comfort zone because someone's going to do it and you might like, that's it's interesting. There was a theme that came out of FinCon along this, which was that converse and create. There's a guy called Pat Flynn. I don't know whether you guys have ever seen any of his stuff. He's got a blog called um, smart passive income. And what he does is his belief is you create the market first and then you productize. Mm -hmm. So he will do free versions of things, blogging, podcasts, and on a topic that you would generally want to learn about or engage with. And he will continually do that until he builds enough of an audience. And then he creates the product or app that serves that. And it sells out in 24 hours. So I think there's a lesson there about, you know, creating the market you then want to deliver something to instead of delivering the thing and then hoping the market will build over time because we yeah. know it doesn't work. And in, as I think in advice, as advisors, we suffer from this with the product providers. So I think all well-meaning, they will build a new, I don't know, app on our computers to help us price premiums or whatever the hell it is. Like they'll spend a whole lot of money on something, but they'll do it in a void They'll, they'll spend a fortune and then bring it out and we'll all go, oh, well, that doesn't help at all. <laughs> so then it's money wasted. We've all seen that, right, over and over again. Um, and so I think there's a real lesson there about engaging and, and conversing with your audience, collecting more of them, building that following, building that tribe, and then asking them what they want and then giving it to them. I wonder, Peter, if that's that's an interesting opportunity to, to uh, ask Clayton, Daniel, who's... Uh, of one of the co-founders of XY Advisor, but he's, he started his own super fund, Sprout Super, and they, they've they kind of done a, a real sort of interesting, uh, I, I guess, product structure where I, I think it's 10%, you can, you can elect to have up to 10% of your super fund invested in um, a, a selection of startups that, that you choose. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if it's worth asking the likes of Clayton whether or not it was, uh, you know, the market asking him for a product like that rather than him sort of waking up one day and, and deciding that, yeah, that yeah, this is something I might do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love the idea of almost a um, Tinder for super. You took the words out of his mouth, actually. <laughs> I love that concept, you know, and, and particularly is um, anything to me that creates more engagement. I think the things that have, if you think of the sweeping changes or, or sorry, some of the evolution in the industry, particularly. The in sweeping or the swiping? Yeah, swiping. Swiping <laughs> changes. Love it. Um, yeah, if you take a look at things like um, the life cycle, what's it called? You know, when it's based on what they invest your portfolio based on your life stages. Sorry life stages investing, you know, there's a whole lot of things like that, that actually cause people to disengage, right? Because they don't have to, because the super fund just does it all. And I think it's a fundamental flaw. We've got to stop treating the public like children. Uh, and so anything that gets them to take action and engage, uh, mm. I think is going to make such a difference. We're just looking at that now with a new offering we're putting together. It's just a sort of service offering, but actually it will, they will make all the decisions and we will engage with them. We might be the nag, but they're the ones that are going to prompt action. They're the ones that are going to hit go um, and really get them to care, you know, and engage mm. instead of just letting them sit back. Oh, super something you just let sit. I think there's a whole lot of language we've allowed to get attached to financial services that's all bad, in my opinion. Mm. Well, I suppose there's a difference between a, a product led value proposition and an advisor led pro value proposition. So, um, a product's happy for you to sit there as long as possible and they can clip the ticket. An advisor, advisor, we got the tough job because um, we've got to stay relevant and uh, I mean, you, get, you get quite a different thought process where you're going. I think so. I, I agree in terms of how it is now. I, I don't think though actually that's the way growth models work and I think that's actually what the industry is struggling with now. I think um, we've all been fighting over scraps instead of just growing the pie. 
you know, <laughs> just make the pie freaking bigger, <laughs> which you please, you know. So, so instead of worrying about the super that exists, why don't we get people to engage with it more? So there'd probably be twice as much super available for everybody to help with. So I think mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think the current, you know, product providers, you know, sit, you know, sit on it, you know, try not to get people to engage with it because then they might move it. You know, they're fearful of that stuff instead of realizing that if we get people to engage with it, they're more likely to put money in it. You got a question also though when you when you talk about you know the a sustainable value proposition. Do you really want to be the person that has to shoot the lights out and come up with the next best winning idea and you know always have the the shiny toy, or do you want to be the person that just facilitates someone running their own journey and as you say, prodding or nudging and making sure you're keeping them passes. You know, I know I know which one I can sustainably do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And look, I think that's why. Um, yeah. That's why I love to just go out and find out what other people are doing. Because to me, it's about seeing what's working elsewhere and then just tweaking what we're doing. You know, we just constantly renovate our business. We constantly just adjust it a bit to make it better, either for the clients or for the team. You know, I mean, that's that's our view. So I'm with you. I think um, I don't want to be the first person to do a brand new thing. I want to be the quiet achiever that suddenly <laughs> has market share that nobody ever expected because we've been just ticking away. Um, oh, that's all right, Peter. I'll, I'll make all the mistakes on your behalf. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fair, though, you know, we, right. We all need a crush test dummy. <laughs> we, we do say over and over again that right, we, yeah. we only deal with 20% of, of Australians. So, you know, whilst we joke, it's, 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 there are markets there that have not been identified. So we are not stepping on each other's toes. Correct. And, Go, and learn, share, and, you know, improve. We're not, we're not eating each other's lunch. We're, no, you know, we're, not at all. <laughs> well, that's the yeah. essence of XY Advisor. It's like, I guess, the sharing that we've seen on the group and what everyone's been happy to share with each other. That's, I, I think that, that's, that's one of the key philosophies of what we've been doing. And I think um, people have been drawn to that because it's, it's a nice place to be. Think, think positively. Think about I think it is. I think though, what I'm hoping to start seeing more of in the industry, which is what I love about going to the States is, is then prompting action. Mm. So I think there's still, I think in advice, we sit and watch a bit, you know, we sort of sit back and well, we'll see what they're doing and we'll see. And maybe five years later, once we've assessed it, then we'll do something. And I think I'd like, I'd love to, to inspire more people to just sort of, and I'm not talking about leaping into the deep end, but just to start taking action and, and trying things out a bit more. I think we've, we're um, certainly not quite got the entrepreneurial gene that I'd love to see more in advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adrian, so just, just circling back to the, the, the event, I wanted, wanted to start talking about, you know, sharing and, and the community. One of the questions we got on the, the group were, um, you know, may, maybe identifying how uh, AI can be used. Uh, to identify areas of, of opportunity when it comes to advice. So, you know, not, not necessarily uh, engaging with the client through AI, but actually doing analysis and assessments and making it relative to, to the values that an individual has mm. uh, and, and, and giving that to the advisor to then, to then um, you know, manage the relationship and, and work them through. Um, would, you, would you sort of agree, Adrian, that that's kind of a, a big, big thing? Oh, it's huge. Like, I think um, when you look at where like a lot of the AI comes from, it's based on data. So the AI doesn't work unless it's got information to work off. And I think, and like, I think Peter's probably going to discover next week, I'm guessing that a lot of these plays are, are for data that can then be used to add another layer of value on top. And I, I think, um, I think there, there was a comment like on, on the, just before in terms of this morning uh, about Nod thinking of going towards that, um, AI piece and after and it looks like in a way like you everyone that's sort of contributing and be a part of this marketplace is contributing to that and I think that's that's how a lot of these things if you look at Google you look at Facebook they've got to get the data first before they can make the magic happen um, mm -hmm. I was I was listening to a podcast uh, actually, was it this morning or yesterday and it was it was actually about how IBM Watson's being used in the recruitment and like onboarding process for for people into new businesses Sorry, Adrian, just to clarify for people that might not know ABN uh, Watson. Oh, IBM, IBM Watson. So it's, IBM. it's Watson, Watson's IBM's supercomputer, artificial intelligence, where they're employing it, applying it to all their clients and wherever they can stick it. And it's, um, it's one of the most powerful artificial intelligence um, setups in the world as that's public <laughs> and um, yeah, the, the example was they're applying it to people just coming into, um, into a new business. 
and looking at, okay, well, there's always all these questions that people have. People are different, so they're asking different things. They want to know different things. So it's like a lot of us are sort of going, well, shit, we're going we're to make sure we have that all available and have a, a knowledge base and all the answers to everything. But what this is doing, it's like going, okay, well, this person, it's reading data of this type of person and capturing it in different ways. And, and reading how what would be more appropriate and putting that information in front of them. So even rem removing the need for them to actually have a thought process to go there, it's giving it to them on a platter. And if you think about that sort of analogy with advice, it's sort of with all the new tech stuff, we're starting to get a lot more information. We're definitely getting data points around people's spending, where it's going, and um, in, especially with a lot of the data feed, bank data feeds and things like that. The next evolution of that is where um, like there's this, this, when your bills are coming up, or obviously, and that sort of thing. But if you start applying deeper thought and co cross-correlating that with other information that we've got, um, that's when you start to get some really powerful insights. And it could be something like these, these, these software providers, they may get a certain demographic. It might be all the data points. But then an advisor has these conversations and if an advisor can sort of have these conversations that translate into a data point and get cross correlated with with these other more traditional data points of assets and um, expenses and where people are spending their money you're going to start to see like i don't know what it's going to be but you, you're going to start to see some insights that come out of this and this is sort of stuff if you grab that data and drop it into watson it just gives you sort of inferences and connections that you wouldn't have even yeah. and I think I think one of the challenges we've got with this in our industry is what we measure, like you say, is spending or money, right? Mm. So that's an output. That's something that's that's like a symptom, right? So so money or you're spending is a symptom. What we don't have really is any data on the cause. So we don't have any data on behaviours. And the minute Watson, like supercomputers like Watson, can start analysing behaviours, mm. that's when you can forecast trends you can forecast something that's coming up. So, um, you know, we're doing some work, um, some coaching work in dreams, right? And so getting, reminding people how to dream and then teaching them how to turn those dreams into reality. And so naturally we're, oh, we should have an app, right? Because everybody needs an app, maybe not. Um, but what was interesting about that is I just started chatting to some mates that are sort of in the ad space, right? And they said, well, actually, so what you're saying is you're just going to get collect people's dreams on an app. How many are you talking, Peter? I went like a well, minimum of 80 to 100 per person. And I want them to constantly add. I went, hold on, so... You're going to be collecting the hopes and dreams of like a big group of people. That's a big data opportunity. And it never occurred to me that. And they said, and what's unusual about it is it's not a, a symptom. It's a, it's a cause data opportunity. And so what we might find is when you get all that data mm -hmm. is that suddenly there's a huge trend for people wanting to work in overseas for six months and in Australia for six months or, or a huge trend in people wanting to uh, not own property or like you can start to see the underlying thought processes and things that are driving people instead of just doing historic, like responding to historical trends. Cause you know, we, the world's moving too fast. You know, if we just define things by historical trends, we're all going to lose. Mm. I wonder, Peter, do you have a view, if, you know, this stuff is very powerful, right? So I think with that comes responsibility. Um, and I just wonder what your views are around the, the ethics or, you know, the requirement then to regulate because in theory, we're talking about having the information to guide people how we at, at will, and obviously we're talking about an application that that's uh, you know in, in a client's best interest. But you know, there's there's the ugly side of this as well, right? Yeah, and I think um, well, because there's two there's two issues there. It's it's um, taking care of somebody's possessions, and their possessions can be their tangible ones, and their possessions can be their data you know, and their thoughts and, and their hopes. So I agree, we've got an obligation to do that. That, that exists in every industry and it's becoming more and more real and there is more, more and more legislation around that. Um, but I think the other obligation we have is to be able to use intellect. So remembering, so Watson is, is a supercomputer. So what it's doing is processing something in the time it used to take a hundred years to process it, it can do it like this. So therefore it can see trends only because you find a trend by processing the same thing thousands of times, right? So, so that's all it's gonna pick up on. There's an obligation for us to be able to apply human nature and care to some of that stuff. So the data we might be getting from a person or the analysis or this AI might've said, right, this person is this type, but we meet them 
And what we can see is that perhaps their history has made them that type, but they're not that type at all. Or, you know, so there's a, there's almost, I think, a need for some more psychological understanding going forward with this stuff, because I think that's where it's going to go wrong. Mm. We're going to think data is truth and it's just not, mm. you know, it's data isn't the truth of anything. It's just a measure. Um, okay. And so, you know, it's matching the human stuff with the data. Well, a great, I reckon a great example of that is you think about like what, what you see on Facebook in terms of um, the retargeting of people yeah. and, and, and that's good. And it, it's got a high strike rack of someone that's gone somewhere um, or that's been to a website and then they follow them on Facebook because, well, there was obviously some sort of interest there, but like that's on a historical data point. And a lot of those people, like it's only, you're hitting, an, it's a numbers game again because you're still going off historical data, you don't really know how much that person was actually interested. Yeah. Um, except for how many times they clicked or whatever. And there's a certain correlation, but imagine if you knew what their problem was and why they were looking at that in the first place. Correct. So if, if there was a, if you had that data point of what the cause was them going there, then that's where you start to, and, then, and they do do that in terms of like before downloading an ebook, you say, Oh, why are you here? And that, that can be an F inference. But if you look at some of the stuff Ray's doing and what they're looking at at Traster, like that Finn Life piece, it's like you're going to places that a lot of this, you go, we've got the advantage to go deeper and get yeah. deeper data than purely by being in front of people yeah. and forming those relationships that then gives us, um, I guess, the ability to use all the other data points and create a bit of a masterpiece that sort of um, links the two together. Because there is, there's, there's real um, beauty in, in that sort of randomness, randomness. So, so, you know, the best, you could create the best artwork via a computer, but it still would never feel quite magical. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a part of the human nature, you just can't create a machine. And I think that's the element where I'm sort of focusing more on my skills. So it's the communicating, it's the understanding human nature, because I think that's our differentiation. Um, mm. And it's why ethics is so important in what we're doing in the industry going forward, because ethics is a reflection of some of that, you know, it's a, well, how far are you willing to go? Who are you? And what do you represent? You know, and what are your standards? And what are your, you know, people sort of throw away ethics is something that's like a tick box. To me, it needs to be at the, at the start of what we start learning in this industry, because it's a portion of psychology. I you think, know, because- I, I think the, the ethics side is, is probably, you know, perhaps, our, you know, and this is a trace of you now, perhaps a criticism of the, the goals based advice structure is, you know, sometimes it feels like advisors are guilty of just taking orders from their clients and, you know, you're on that first layer. So, okay, you want to buy a house, accept that. Okay, you want to buy a car, accept that. Okay, the kids are going to private school, accept that. And then I'll build a savings plan or, a, or a, you know, structure that'll get you there. And that's, that's all it is. Where What we're talking about, uh, you know, in this conversation and, and some of the work that we've been doing in, in, at Tradester is understanding the person, understanding the values, understanding the heuristics and the biases that are influencing people's decision-making processes that get them to the table and say, hang on, my house is important. So that, you know, when you, when you do understand those drivers and the whole thing works in concert and it all makes much more sense. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, that's the reason we've been doing this dream stuff because, you know, I was reflecting on myself and the way I've made choices and from my investment banking days versus now and, you know, my friends and family. And I realized a lot of us are just on the treadmill that society says we should be on. And so when an advisor says what your goals are, you're like, yeah, I should buy a house. Like, but do you really want to? You know? is, that, is that an acceptable goal? Because I'll yeah. take that one. <laughs> what has everyone else said? <laughs> right. and, and there are many, adv- I've had people come to me where many advisors, where somebody said what I want to do is, and a good example, it actually happened when we were in Stanford, you know, I want to take two years off and go to Stanford and study and I'm going to change my career. And an advisor has told them that's not a good idea. Like, hold on. <laughs> Mm. How do you know that's not a good idea? Who the hell are you to say that? No, you but, need to get the 25 grand a year into superannuation and, and be miserable. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about robo advice, you could talk about robo clients, right? I mean, do yeah. we really want to create a world of all the same people doing the same thing? I prefer the reverse. I would prefer to inspire people to challenge the norm. If we can empower them with some good decision-making skills, 
which is really what we're talking about here is knowing themselves well enough to make some decent decisions and then take mm -hmm. some action. Um, if we can empower them to do that, then imagine the great stuff they're going to do. You know, that's what I prefer to see. Whereas putting them in a box because that's the list of things that they felt they should do and forcing them to do it. And then 40 years later, they realize they should never have <laughs> had that job, bought that house or potentially even had that partner. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bit horrifying, but it's, it's sort of real. I agree. Some of the goal-based stuff, um, it is making huge assumptions about what somebody wants to or should do in their lives. So is, yeah. is that maybe a question for, I'm just thinking on our panel next week, like the one that's, the guy that's across a lot of this stuff in terms of some of the stuff that's going direct to clients um, and stuff that's going to the intermediary space advisors is Ben. And if you think about um, what we're talking about, it's sort of like who who's playing in that space that's sort of that front front end? Who's Who's sort of capturing the new insights, the psychological pieces that yeah. that advisors can actually um, work with it or, or who's creating tools that help advisors do that. Because it's not, if it was easy, then a lot of, a lot of people would be doing it already and Peter yeah. wouldn't be going around and people calling her crazy sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> Often, not sometimes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if it was a natural gravitation, then it would be done already. Um, and I think... I think, yeah, that'd be really interesting to find yeah, out. Yeah, I've yeah. noted that down. I think, I think the other thing, though, we need to acknowledge to be able to move forward is that when you start focusing on these things, what we're saying is that what we do for clients isn't necessarily the complexity of analysis and finance that we've sort of created this, this smoke and mirrors around our industry historically. So there's been a lot of, you know, the whole um, finance, economics, commerce, and it's all, it's all numbers and, and it's, it's for brainiacs and that like we've, we've created this sort of myth. And uh, what we're saying here is actually, maybe it's not all about that at all. And it's, it's EQ mm. rather than IQ that's the big game. And I think we've got to put our hands up and admit that so that then we, cause I think a lot of the industry still retreats behind the other stuff, you know? So they're sort of hiding behind creating this image of what the, the you know, the finance industry is smarter than everybody else. Um, which is, it's a misnomer. You know, I just don't think it's real. I think the people I really respect are the ones that can sort of gel those two things. You know, it's a, it's an IQ EQ blend that that's really powerful then because it's the human with some of the other analytical stuff would it I, I suppose to overlay on that in terms of like that stuff the reason why people do it is because it's still it's a business model that works and like and it works until it doesn't work yeah and i guess what our point is is that it's, it's i don't think we're talking about really like a um, you're getting clients that engage with that. They have a good time and, ever, and and there's a high level of trust and there's a high level of engagement and people are getting good outcomes. But what I guess the message that maybe we're sort of talking about here is that that's not always going to be the case. And if you want to prepare your business for the future, that that may not stack up as much. And that's what we're seeing with the new generations that are coming through. Yeah, and I think so that's something that came across in FinCon that was used a lot um, in terms of what, what you ultimately are delivering to the public and the word they use is transformation. So if you're not in the business of transformation, it's a short term proposition. You know, you're just filling a small need. Whereas if you're in the business of transformation, they'll be with you forever. And I think um, that's an interesting lesson for us in advice, because I'm not sure we could all say that we've transformed lives. I think we've impacted them, no doubt, you know, and I think we, there's a lot of great work done by advisors, but there's, some other things we could do to be in that transformation business, you know, where it's yeah. just their world is literally completely changed. Um, I wonder if that's a really, really kind of wonderful sentiment to, to you know, uh, lead lead into the event on, on Thursday, um, just con a little conscious of, of time. Um, you know, I think one of my key takeaways from today's is just more eloquently articulating the idea that, you know, I, IQ is being outsourced to the robots and the technology, which isn't actually a bad thing. It, it actually allows us to spend time on the application of that IQ and spend time on the EQ. Uh, and, and to that end, uh, I, I'm sure Peter will be uh, sp uh, hounding the guys. So we've got Joel, Joel Robbie of, of Nod as, as one of the panelists. We've also got Ben Heap of, of H2 Ventures and dear friend Clayton Daniel of of sprouts so peter i encourage you not to let the guys get off lightly and uh <laughs> and really really get them to, to uh, yeah keep, keep them honest around this stuff and uh with that I, I i thank you very very much peter and uh and as well adrian for for the time today i'm sure this is going to be one of the it was the quickest 45 minutes i've, I've kind of ever done on, on live that just flew
It was, it was awesome. Chat. And I'm look, I'd love to hear from the group. So from on the Facebook group, if there's things that people really want to know. So I know Adrian's done a post on there, but if there's something you're curious about, don't understand, um, would love to ask, but would never put your hand up. You know, I'm happy to ask anything. So if there's a question you have, either put it in a Facebook group or even message me um, because- Or you can I, email the XY Advisor, contact exactly. the XY Advisor. Because um, honestly, be I'll ask them anything. So, so yep. now's your chance. If you're a bit shy to put your hand up, um, whether you'll be there next Thursday or not, then, then please put that question through and I'm happy to ask it. Yeah, it's a good point. We're not, we, you know, we, we, we differentiate ourselves. This isn't a, an, an opportunity for the three guys to, to sprout what they're, what they're good at. You know, keep, let's keep them honest. And... That was such a good pun, right? <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Look, thank you so much. Uh, re really, really appreciate it. And uh, a big thank you to uh, our partners for the, for the uh, XY Lives this year, AII. They, they allow us to do this every week. So a uh, big thank you to, to them. And, and with that, uh, have a wonderful afternoon as, as we lead into the weekend and we, we hope to see you all next Thursday. Yeah, see you next week, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much. It's been a bye -bye. Bye -bye.